All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all for joining us today, um, whether it's on your lunch break or later in the evening or early in the morning, depending on what time zone you may be in. I'm Jordan Money. I'm the Director of Events and Communications at the Center for Security Studies and the Security Studies Program. Uh, we will get started in just a moment, but a few quick notes first. Um, first, you all know the drill. I imagine at this point with Zoom, please do remain muted throughout so that we don't have any distracting background noise. Um, you are welcome to have your camera on or off for this session, um, particularly during the, the discussion and the Q&A portion. We encourage you to turn your cameras on so that we can have a true interactive discussion, um, but feel free to keep it off, particularly during the beginning part of the presentation. Um, on that note, we will have plenty of time for Q&A later on. You uh, can submit your questions either directly to me or use the raise hand function in Zoom. Just know that uh, we'll do questions at the end of the presentation. So if questions come up during the initial presentation, feel free to drop them in the chat, but we won't ask them until we get a little bit further along. And then finally, this session is being recorded. So just keep in mind that anything you say will be recorded as well, as well as your uh, video if you do have your camera on and you are speaking, but we will not be recording the gallery view. So if you are not speaking, you won't be recorded on camera. And with all of that out of the way, I'd like to introduce Noor Long, our, uh, our speaker for the day. Noor is a research analyst at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology, better known sometimes as CSET. Her research at CSET focuses on Chinese state-backed investments in artificial intelligence and other strategic in industries, as well as the role of the private sector in AI development. She has a magna cum laude degree in international politics and economics from Middlebury College. And prior to joining CSET, she conducted research on China's political economy and foreign policy and was a China policy intern at the Center for American Progress, where she tracked China's global ambitions in 5G and researched China's industrial policies. With all of that said, I would like to turn it over to Noor. Uh, she can take it away from here. Thanks, Jordan. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, that was a really kind introduction. Thank you. I also would like to thank the Center for Security Studies um, for extending the opportunity for me to share my work today on the panel. Um, and as you can see on the screen, I'll be presenting on some of the work that I've done at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, or CSET, uh, with respect to China's AI development. And uh, frankly, there are so many core elements of China's AI power including tech transfer, um, talent flow, AI military capabilities, hardware, semiconductor, et cetera. And my colleagues at CSAT have been working extensively on each of these issues. And today, just um, I'll be tackling this topic from the industrial policy angle uh, and discuss how some of the industrial policy mechanisms used by the Chinese government may or may not be fueling China's uh, technological ambitions, including AI. And here's a quick agenda for the first half an hour. Um, I'll introduce who we are as an organization, organization and then briefly talk about China's AI policies. Next, I'll discuss um, how China's AI industry looks like using a case studies of uh, China's AI Industry Alliance or AIIA. Finally, I'll close with how the Chinese government is funding its AI development and explain the emerging investment mechanism known as government guidance funds. Um, and then we'll open the floor for Q&A uh, for the remaining half an hour. Um, so just quickly about CSED, um, we are a relatively young organization uh, founded at the start of 2020, uh, 2019 within Georgetown's Wall School of Foreign Service. We produce data-driven research that focuses on issues at the intersection of national security and, and emerging technology. My work at CSED um, so far covers issues related to investment and um, trade and industry. Um, and these are my colleagues that make the research on AI investment possible. Ashwin Achawa has worked on tracking China's public spending on R&D. Zach Arno has worked on uh, research related to trends um, in, in global investment. Tina Huang's uh, research focuses on tracking AI investment. Rebecca Gallus and uh, Ilya Rokoski are data scientists who have a lot of experience with financial data. And finally, Ben Murphy, um, he is our 
STEM translation lead. So we have a lot of resources in the organization to work on this kind of um, issues. And before we dive in, I really just want to highlight some of the key takeaways from this presentation. And I hope you can take, uh, you can learn something from this discussion. Uh, well, first of all, um, the Chinese government brings together the worst public and private actors to help fuel China's AI development by A, establishing collaboration platforms involving public governments, I'm uh, sorry, local governments, academic institutions, and companies. And B, by guiding uh, public and private capital into in, uh, strategic industries. And so um, the second, why should you care about this? So what, why are we talking about this? Um, well, the Chinese government is investing politically and financially to make these mechanisms the pillars of China's AI development, even if they are uh, inherently flawed and also possess a lot of contradictions. Uh, and with so with a lot of um, capital and resources putting into this kind of mechanisms, it's very important to, to take a look at them. And just quickly on China's AI policies, uh, Chinese leaders definitely see, uh, see they see AI as, as a core aspect of domestic growth and global technological leadership. Uh, and these strategic goals are definitely enshrined in high level policy documents, uh, especially in the 20, 2017 States Council's uh, New Generation AI Development Plan, as shown here. Uh, and as pertains to the, their AI industry development, China leaders set the target of 150 billion RMB or $22.7 billion uh, of AI industry growth. And it's also worth noting that China's leaders recognize that private companies are currently leading the charge of AI development. And so to leverage the role of these companies and allocate more capital into strategic industries, Chinese governments at central, provincial, and local levels are using many industrial policy tools, including traditional mechanisms such as direct subsidies, tax incentives, um, and, and direct cash handouts, um, as well as state-backed AI collaboration platforms such as uh, industry alliances and industrial parks, and government guidance funds, which bring together public and private uh, actors into um, this kind of ecosystem. And um, I'll discuss the last two points in detail, um, but they certainly complement and also sometimes are used to amplify the effects of the direct subsidies, tax, uh, tax incentives, and cash handouts in the first point. So the, these are all going to be discussed in this uh, presentation. I, they, they certainly are important. Um, so first, we'll take a look at the relevant players that are responsible for the rapid growth of China's AI industry and development. Um, quickly, um, I just want to cover uh, a couple points. For example, uh, according to the 14th five-year plan, um, the Chinese leaders have committed to building an efficient platform and also a system for organizing innovation. And we all know that innovation is, is definitely an important element of China's uh, emerging technology development. And um, these innovation platforms include industry alliances that bring together local governments, research institutions, and companies uh, to basically build an organization that they can collaborate on certain topics. And I'll discuss that uh, in detail in a little bit. Um, this type of collaboration platform is, is actually listed as a policy tool in the new generation, uh, new, AI, new generation AI development plan, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and just quickly, industry alliances are uh, typically established by a government sponsor, and they have priorities that are pretty consistent with the central government's priorities. We, um, at CISA, we selected China's AI Industry Alliance as a case study um, to examine. And just a brief background on this alliance. Uh, they, uh, this alliance was established in 2017 and sponsored by really high level government departments, including the Ministry of Science and Technology. And they have government members, include the, including the, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, Institute of Automation. They also attracted um, top universities, including Peking University and Tsinghua University, and other uh, members that, other member companies that are active in the China's AI industry, um, including really well-known tech giants um, like the BAT, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tenzin, um, as well as other large companies in 
um, other industries like Huawei, large AI focused technology, uh, large AI focused companies like iFi Tech, and obscure startups like this company called rsquare.ai. Um, there are a lot of those in this alliance, and um, they are certainly important players that are responsible for China's AI development. And so um, for the forthcoming paper uh, authored by uh, me and Zach Arnold, we extracted and annotated the membership list of the Alliance. Um, and this is one of the findings that I want to highlight today. Um, the Alliance is said to be market-driven and also dominated by companies, but, uh, and it's also true that 500 of the 511 companies of the um, 567 members are um, private companies. Um, but uh, in fact, we found that um, state-owned enterprises embed themselves in the leadership structure of the alliance. Uh, as seen here, SOEs and government members together account for nearly half of the alliance uh, vice chair's membership tier. And so this is also pretty consistent with the uh, increased control over private companies under Xi Jinping. And um, with the state dominated leadership structure established, the Alliance has expanded its role uh, to connecting public and private actors to engage in activities that reflect the central government's priorities in AI. And here's a couple examples that illustrate this kind of dynamic. Um, I'll demonstrate some of them. For example, the Alliance hosts competitions um, to, to broker relationships between SOEs and private companies. For example, China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation, which is the vice chair of the Alliance and, an S and a major SOE in China. Um, they work together with the Alliance to host a competition to promote algorithm applications that relied on military civil integration and AI. Another example is um, the Alliance has convened groups to, um, to develop benchmarks. For example, it advocated for AI chip standards led by authoritarian platforms like itself over those developed by private companies. Um, and this is pretty consistent with, with, the, with the dynamic um, between the market and the state um, that happens in, in, uh, domestically. The government seeks to remain dominant, but also tolerates the market decision until it's no longer serving the state interest. And so um, this, this is uh, the kind of findings that we, we see uh, in this particular example. Um, next, the Alliance has also picked winners um, in AI by helping Chinese government di distribute subsidies to favored AI companies. For example, this one company is called iDeepWise. It's, it's a company specialized in um, brain-inspired AI and deep learning, and it has received thousands of dollars in cash rewards, R&D subsidies, and um, investment from a state-backed fund. And so you might say this is not a huge amount, thousands of dollars um, in, in investment, it's not, it's not much, but it could be decisive for um, early stage companies that need a lot of capital to, to grow. It could break or make the, uh, the company. Um, and finally, the Alliance publishes papers. Um, for example, a 2020 white paper on intellectual property was a product of collaboration between um, government bureaus, top universities, and tech giants, including um, Baidu. So these are the kind of activities that the Alliance does um, to bring together public and private actors um, that are active in the China's AI industry together to you know, meet the ambitions uh, of the state. And so, as we know, um, I just cover like some of the actors that are active in China's AI industry. And now um, I am going to cover how the Chinese government uh, funding AI development. Um, and so we follow the money to um, answer this kind of question. Um, and uh, as we know, developing AI is very expensive. We need a lot of capital to do that. Um, and the Chinese government is pouring millions and even billions of dollars, uh, sorry, in RMB um, in, in gov uh, government guidance funds just to do this. In short, government guidance funds are public and private funds that aim to, bo to both produce financial return for the state um, and also further the state's industrial policy goals. And these are uh, the most up-to-date statistics from Zero to IPO, uh, which is an uh, organization, a Chinese organization um, 
that produces independent market research. Um, and they, they list that um, by the end of 2020, Chinese officials at the central, provincial, and local levels have established over 1,800 funds um, with a total size of $1.67 trillion. But actually, in reality, um, these funds have only raised over just a little bit over $800 million. Um, and with that, I um, also wanted to discuss how what sets guidance funds apart from other formally used state backed funds. Um, that is the structure itself uh, uh, of the funds. The Chinese government brings in um, the profit motive of the mechanism by mobilizing both the public and private investment um, and the actors that are involved in these. Um, government sponsors typically contribute about 20 to 30% of capital contribution and raise the rest from social capital investors. And these investors are basically um, equivalent to private investors with no connection to the Chinese government. Uh, and government guidance funds um, use limited partnership structure. Um, a fund has general partners who handle day-to-day uh, -day operation. These are typically state-owned investment or management firm, um, or they could be third-party professional fund managers that actually know what's going on in the market. Um, the, the guidance fund also has limited partners who uh, contribute capital or take losses. They are um, supposed to be social capital investors with truly private capital. Um, but in fact, in reality, they often are SOEs or state-run banks. And um, I wanted to discuss a little bit uh, how successful are these mechanisms. Uh, we find in our paper that uh, guidance funds actually are better than traditional industrial policy schemes. They have several potential benefits. Um, for example, guidance funds bring in the profit motive and help Chinese policy makers leverage market disciplines and expertise um, in the market. And this could potentially help uh, reduce inefficiencies and corruption brought over by um, subsidy schemes. Uh, they also offer patient capital, um, which is essential for um, emerging technology because they have to cross the, this period of time called the valley of death, um, which is uh, the time between um, uh, before a company scales up and when their initial capital runs dry. And so this could potentially help startups uh, co commercialize high quality technologies better and faster. Um, and finally, guidance funds can complement um, and amplify other industrial policy tools, uh, boosting support for the high tech businesses um, overall. But also keep in mind that um, guidance funds prospects, prospects for success are uncertain. Um, there are obvious flaws of, uh, such as the following. Uh, guidance funds often raise money, uh, much less than planned. And even if they do raise money, much of, the, much of uh, the capital they do raise is not actually deployed into um, productive projects. And there are also too many overlapping and inefficient funds, uh, which could potentially lead to inefficiencies in the market as a whole. Uh, they also are poorly managed, um, often by inexperienced bureaucrats with really bad investment decisions. Um, and guidance funds don't really invest in early stage companies enough as intended uh, because a lot of the state back fund managers are too risk averse to do so. And finally, they often fail to attract truly private capital. Uh, and in some cases, they even crowd private capitals out of the market, um, exacerbating the whole problem that already exists in the system. Uh, with that, um, I want to conclude that, um, uh, that this mechanism is still developing. I want you to keep, it, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, and despite all the flaws described earlier, a subset of these funds are still actually raising a lot of money and deploying them in, in, in projects. Um, and there are policy reforms that could potentially improve fund managers and clean up inefficient funds. And these are being deployed into the system um, at the moment as uh, policymakers are trying, are increasingly trying to understand how these funds are working and how to make the system a bit more efficient. Um, and so uh, to, to keep monitoring this, this mechanism, we offer a couple performance indicators, for example, for fundraising, we asking the questions of 
our guidance plans proposing to raise more money or less um, for investment. We want to know if guidance funds are actually investing in early stage projects that are actually, you know, that they need capital to, in order to grow. Uh, and for operation and management, we're asking the question of uh, guidance funds, uh, are governments actually cleaning up ineffective funds or are they still supporting them? Because there are, we, as we know, there are too many funds in the system that are trying to compete for capital and resources and attention from, from policymakers. Um, and with that, uh, I, I um, want, uh, want to um, give a shout out to our organization. Um, we do a lot of um, AI research, related research um, in-house. And uh, uh, if you want to find out more information about our papers um, or whatever information is discussed in this presentation, you can always check out our papers and other um, research um, that we do um, at csa.georgetown.edu slash research. Also, you can always just go to our um, website and sign up for newsletters and uh, to, to follow our research. And with that, um, we can open the floor for questions or if you have any suggestions for the kind of line of research that we, we do at CSET. Thank, so Thank you so much. Um, with that, as Nor said, go ahead. If you have questions, feel free to uh, either raise your hand using the raise hand function in Zoom uh, down under reactions at the bottom of your screen, or you can drop them in the chat and I will ask them out loud. Um, I see we've got some folks from SSP, from CSET, from all over the place here. So please do jump in um, if you have questions. Carson, go ahead. Hi, yeah, um, thanks for the presentation. It's uh, really interesting. Um, I'm curious, I guess I'm uh, I'm aware that some other countries have tried kind of similar approaches. Like I think Israel is, is like a good example um, to this whole like GGF kind of uh, paradigm. And I'm curious if it may be just outside the scope of, of what you looked at, but um, curious kind of how China's programs like differ from those and whether any of the kind of like signs of, of, of what made those successful are also present in, in the Chinese case or just other kind of like compare and contrast between other countries in, in China? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're definitely aware of the Israeli programs as well as um, the US also has its own programs to support its kind of uh, uh, in investment that attracts both public and private actors. Um, like for example, Zipper, um, that's, also, that's a program that helps small businesses uh, to grow um, in a in particular industry. Um, and this is not, this is definitely not new. Uh, this is not like a uniquely Chinese concept. Uh, the idea of state, state intervention um, in businesses, et cetera. Um, but in the Chinese context, uh, the scale and the uh, magnitude of the mechanism is way, it's much more um, uh, tremendous than uh, uh, other countries. It's, the, the scale is huge, as you can see in the, the figures that I've shown in the presentation, um, $1.67 trillion in, in terms of um, how much they want to invest in uh, emerging technologies, especially in AI, using this mechanism. Um, and the Chinese government has also realized that, um, yeah, that this is an important technology for its own domestic economic growth and also for it, uh, the country to uh, compete internationally, especially with the US and Euro European countries. And so it's investing a lot of money and it, it knows um, it has to do this uh, both uh, in terms of financial support and political support for um, its private companies to be, you know, national champions uh, and et cetera. And so uh, just in, in short, um, uh, it's definitely not a, a, a new concept, um, but it's taken to the, the point where um, it's, it's uh, huge in scale and also um, the amount of government intervention is progressive and very uh, concerning. Well, thanks. And Maria. Hello, thank you for your presentation. So right now there is a lot of discussion about uh, G digital infrastructure of Belt and Road Initiative. And because the idea is sort of the same as you mentioned for artificial intelligence, it's Chinese national rejuvenation, and then we have like global leadership. So is 
development, investment in and collaboration with like other countries uh, on artificial intelligence is a part of BRI as well, or it's separate industry and serves separate purposes. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this question definitely deserves a, a whole line of research um, because it's it's just vast and, and huge um, in terms of the scale of uh, uh, the resources that the Chinese government is putting into the BRI. Um, and that is definitely a part of um, China's industrial policy, um, especially orchestrated by the Made in China 2025. Um, and although we, we no longer use that term or like the Chinese government no longer push for that um, concept, um, the idea, the fundamentals of that idea is still there. Um, and uh, if, you, if you step a little bit back, um, you, we, we, we know that um, overall, the Chinese government is trying to um, find a way like industrial upgrading and other um, technological advantage, um, advancement in order to integrate that into the economic system to make it more efficient, right? Um, and that involves also going, going out, as you, you probably, some people here know about the um, going out policy um, as part of its uh, foreign policy and the BRI is part of it. And so these are all um, coming together and interact dynamically um, in order for the whole, the comprehensive policy to work. Um, but again, it's a really interesting topic and I think it, it warrants an uh, entire thesis on such. And so if you are interested in doing that kind of research, I'd be interested in, in seeing um, the results of it. And we have a question in the chat as well from Simona, um, who asks, I'm wondering if you have also looked into whether and or how the outputs of the Chinese government guidance funds and AI industry alliances are translating into the military field. Yes, um, that's a really good question. We have a lot of uh, researchers, as you said, who look into um, AI military capabilities in China. Um, Emily Weinstein uh, definitely is an expert on uh, civil military fusion, and she could tell you a lot more about this um, than, than, than me. Um, and it's a bit out of scope for my research, but um, the Chinese government, uh, for, for guidance funds, we try to look for the, um, the cumulative output of the mechanism, um, but it's really difficult to track that. It's also hard to discern the, uh, the exact amount and the magnitude of the output. Um, but we know that the Chinese government is shifting its attention um, towards that line of uh, uh, development in terms of you know, uh, use, putting a lot of resources and capital um, into developing an idea that uh, incorporates both the military capabilities and the civil, civilian capabilities um, in, in, the, in both directions is to uh, use military capabilities in civilian, um, you know, applications, but also use uh, trying to bring in private companies um, that are doing this kind of research and uh, application and applying this application in the military services as well. And so we know that it's actually happening, but but I can't really tell you how much money or uh, the magnitude it is uh, in reality. And I don't know if anybody is interested. Um, anyone in the audience and having kind of back and forth discussion on this, but I do know we have some of the CSET folks in here. So I don't know, Nora, if um, you wanted to invite them to chime in. I don't want to put them on the spot necessarily. <laughs> I can't really see all the uh, okay. audience, but if anyone wants to chime in, please, please go ahead. I have the participants list open, so I'm recognizing names, but I won't put anyone on the spot. Nora, it's Emily. I, I, I heard you mention my name. I, 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 I asked if someone could repeat the question, I heard it was kind of looking at the intersection of military and AI in China, but um, was, was there more than that? Yeah, so this was a question in the chat about um, if the outputs of the Chinese government guidance funds and AI industry alliances are translating into the military field as well. So, 
from uh, from a military fusion angle, I would say yes, because so looking at China's military civil fusion development strategy um, from a high level, what it's trying to do kind of under Xi Jinping as it's been elevated to a national level strategy is to really weave and embed all aspects of Chinese industrial policy under the umbrella of military civil fusion. Um, so it's really harkening back to the dual use nature of emerging technologies, in particular, in particular AI, obviously. Um, so in improving, you know, as, as Nora has talked a lot about uh, with the government guidance funds, uh, in improving kind of the commercial side of AI, um, whether that be in state-owned enterprises or ostensibly private firms, the Chinese government is always thinking about dual use capabilities, particularly in the military context, obviously. Um, so I would say if the Chinese government is putting a certain amount of money or effort into acquiring or understanding certain aspects of artificial intelligence, they are definitely also thinking about the military sides of that. So yes, long story short, I would say um, they pretty much in most cases will line up um, with the military field in some capacity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I also mentioned a little bit in this presentation that uh, there's a case where the um, Chinese Aerospace Industry um, and Science Corporation, which is an SOE, um, has worked with the Alliance to uh, basically convene activities where they encourage more um, private companies to use the civil military integration uh, in the context of AI to help solve problems. Um, so these kind of activities are happening uh, in the ground. And um, uh, again, this is uh, an example of like efforts met, uh, led by the government to, to um, increase more activities in this space. Thank you, and thank you, Emily, for jumping in um, a little bit on the spot there. Um, who else has questions for our lovely presenter today? And while uh, we give folks a moment to uh, pop questions in the chat or to contemplate, you know, put together their own questions to ask out loud, um, my question for you, so first of all, what's next in terms of the research on this, either for you or for CSET more broadly? And then second, where, besides obviously the reports that you've done for CSET, can people learn more about this if this is something they're interested in keeping up on the latest research on? Absolutely. Um, so what's next for me? I, I expanded my uh, interest uh, a little bit about outside of China and just wanted to look at uh, the ecosystem and um, the AI development ecosystem um, specifically related to uh, the private sector. And so um, I sort of, you know, move away a little bit from China for the next line of research, um, but would like to come back and take a look at the, uh, there's a lot of discussion about the uh, uh, list, like listed companies in China, um, you know, it's, its own market, for example, the science and technology board, or known as STAR, um, that's a newly developed uh, uh, market um, that, you know, actually established by the, the Chinese government itself um, to help, you know, companies that are going to be national champions, for example, those in, you know, uh, active in the chip industry uh, to list there uh, as opposed to like abroad. And so this is kind of research I'm interested in looking into. Um, and for CSED, uh, we are still you know, continue the line of research um, in terms of uh, application and uh, foundation of China development uh, and as well as like leverage uh, how the Chinese government is using all these uh, tools that they have at, the, at the disposal to uh, advance its China's ambition, uh, AI ambitions. Um, so again, in short, it's just going to continue um, and we'll probably look at other um, emerging technologies as well. Uh, Zhang Hun, I see you have a question. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this great presentation. I, have a, um, I kind of want to go back to the relationship between SOE and uh, private entities and, and the uh, alliance. Just wondering if you could elaborate a little more on how that interaction occurs. And also wondering if um, the Chinese government is actually uh, funding these alliance and you know there are some academic institutions there um, just curious well what are some of the power dynamics within the alliance and how those corporation um, 
take place. Yeah, absolutely. So for the industry alliance, um, the the idea itself uh, exists outside of artificial intelligence. Um, it just has a subset of um, a subset of group to focus on part artificial intelligence. But um, industry alliance is um, the the platform itself. Uh, the idea is to bring a lot of actors into uh, an ecosystem where they can interact and collaborate. And one example that I've seen uh, is there is an industry alliance um, that works to sort of bring to to formulate a party building alliance. Um, and I and I discussed it in the paper that is going to come out. If you're interested in looking at that um, in more detail. But the in short, um, the party. You, we, we all know that um, China is in, in, increasing its efforts to um, embed more party party building in in private companies, and we see that in the form of uh, party secretaries in companies, including Walmart. Walmart has a party secretary, um, and uh, in the other form, uh, industry alliances are basically supplying um, actors, uh, especially in private companies, uh, to these party building alliance. And they also they also broker relationships between SOEs and uh, private companies, for example, like allowing them to sign agreements to collaborate on uh, a line of product or um, a line of research. And uh, another example is that you know these companies are coming together to collaborate and write papers on uh, like intellectual property or on um, uh, there's another example. I'm I'm it's slipping my mind, but um. These papers are basically really important um, and they're going to determine um, or even influence uh, policy makings in, in China. Um, recently, intellectual property uh, rights are, are being discussed and being examined by Chinese scholars as well uh, to see if actually, you know, going to make any impact uh, on, on China's patent de development, et cetera. Yeah, I hope this has answered your question. Um, yeah. The dynamic is very interesting. You want to dig into it. Okay, thank you. We do have a little bit more time here. Um, we can, of course, always wrap up early if you all are secretly working on finals in the background. Uh, Maria, go ahead and you can ask your question. Yes, yeah, you mentioned intellectual property rights. I think I could not, not ask this question. So China, there's been a lot of concerns worldwide about like China violating intellectual property rights abroad. So right now with China heavily investing and increasing its IA capabilities, AI capabilities. So what is happening with regards to laws in China? How their treatment of this legislation has changed and yeah, what are the things we we should know about? Yeah, absolutely. This is a really important question. Um, and although I haven't really dug a, really deeply into this kind of topic, um, just from what I've read and from my, to my knowledge, uh, the, the law landscape in China is not, you know, what we see in the US or um, other uh, developed um, areas and um, or countries. Uh, and the party is definitely on the top of the law. Um, as to just to quote, to quote Xi Jinping, the party is the leader of all. And so um, in terms of just like, you know, on the topic of law itself, like it's not as um, dynamic and it's not, not as, um, uh, it, it's not the way that we, we, we see it in, um, in, in the US, for example. Um, and in terms of intellectual property rights, uh, I've seen a couple more policy documents coming out um, recently, especially earlier this year, um, that focused on, you know, try, the, Xi Jinping is saying, uh, we need to develop uh, our intellectual property uh, rights because innovation is the key to development. Um, that's that's also a policy document that is translated by CSA that you want to take a look at our website um, and, and read that policy document. Um, it's really important to to look at like what uh, the you know high high quality and high level policy documents are saying. And um, 
although there's a lot of commitments coming from the central government, it's really difficult to implement this. As we know, you know, there's uh, there is a discrepancy in terms of what the central government wants and um, what is actually happening on the ground in local provinces and um, implemented by local officials. And so we have to probably watch out for these kind of um, policies and see if they actually implemented correctly. Um, and yeah, that's that's probably all I could say on uh, on that line. Thank you. Um, we have a question that just came in through the chat as well. You mentioned that China continues to use guidance funds for now, but given their mixed performance, what do you think are their long-term prospects as a policy tool? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very that's a very important question to ask, um, which is also the kind of question we ask in our paper. Um, we see that they have potential benefits um, to the as an industrial policy tool to the Chinese government's uh, development of AI and other emerging technologies. Um, but we also see a lot of flaws. Um, and these, these flaws are actually inherent in the system as well. Um, and they are linked to the institutional um, problems, including like, as there, there's a lot of government intervention in this kind of uh, policy. And as well as um, the reluctance coming from the policy makers uh, in allowing the market to run as exactly it is. Um, and so this kind of problems will continue, but will, um, and the development of uh, this tool is also not certain. Uh, but again, like it's, it's important to recognize that these tools are actually working to, to, to a certain extent. Um, and these funds are developed and are, are raising a lot of money and deploying a lot of money into but projects that are working, uh, for example, like semiconductors, uh, which is a, a key industry that the Chinese is trying to gain self-reliance and uh, for a development, you know, away from relying on export um, from the US or the European countries. And so um, these, these tools are, are, are working and we certainly have to monitor them. And we definitely provide some performance indicators in our paper um, if you are interested in in tracking and learning more about how these funds are going to develop uh, or pan out in the next couple of years or decades. But they're going to stay because the Chinese government is investing a lot of money and um, uh, political capital into this kind of thing. And I did just drop the link in the chat for the uh, full report on the CSET website. Uh, so please do go ahead and check that out if you're interested in digging into some of these issues that have been raised today. Thank you, Jordan. Mm -hmm. And I, so I'll give a last call for questions if anyone has any in our last little bit of time here. Um, I would like to thank you again, Nor, for joining us today and talking us through this really interesting topic, um, even if I will admit to as a uh, non-tech person and non-security person, not completely understanding it myself, um, but it was fascinating to listen to anyway. Um, for those of you who want to come back to the recording of this presentation, we will put it up on the Center for Security Studies YouTube channel, um, most likely either by the end of the day today or sometime tomorrow. Um, so I will give you, uh, you have five seconds left if anybody has remaining questions. Um, and Nora, any final words that you would like to give to uh, the audience members? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know that SSB is uh, producing a lot of uh, um, really high performing students who are interested in this area. And um, I'm really happy to, to be here, to be part of a, a really um, smart minded people. Um, and uh, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions about um, the papers themselves or uh, have suggestions for, you know, future line of research that CSA can, can provide. Um, and with that, yeah, I'm happy to be here and answer your questions in the future if you have any. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you all in the audience for joining us and for the great discussion. Um, have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, evening, morning, whatever time it may be where you are. Um, and thank you again, Nora, for joining us. Thanks so much. Take Bye care, everyone. everyone.